Hello, everyone. Welcome to this event by Latinas Represent. My name is Stephanie Lopez, and I am the program director at Latinas Represent. And Latinas Represent is an initiative that focuses on increasing the number and diversity of Latinas in public office. Um, we do have a disclaimer saying that as a nonpartisan initiative, we do not endorse or oppose any candidate, party, or platform. So all the views that are expressed during uh, today's uh, programming are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Latinas Represent. Um, we have a lot to get through today and our uh, candidate, I mean our elected official that's on the call today is actually going to be heading to a meeting at the end of this call. So I wanted to go ahead and jump straight into the conversation. Um, and so Honestly, I wanted to introduce everyone first, and then we'll jump straight in. So first of all, I want to introduce you all to Elsa Mejia. She is the city council member for District 5 of Madera, the, the Madera City Council in California. She is the daughter of indigenous immigrant farm workers, a granddaughter of a bracero, and a first generation college graduate. Uh, fun fact, Elsa and I actually went to college together. We went to Fresno State, which is where I met her. And she got a bachelor's degree in political science and journalism, as well as a certificate in legal studies. Elsa has been heavily involved in social justice causes and currently uses her communication skills to help union workers. So she currently lives in Madera with her husband. Um, and then the next guest that we have today is Joanna Torres. She was born in the heart of California's Central Valley. She serves her community through advocacy work at the California Rural Legal Assistance, Inc., uh, Madera's regional office. She also co-founded Madera Votes, which is a nonpartisan group that aims to foster civic engagement. Her work and life are centered around helping people and help, helping to create an equitable society and inclusive Central Valley. Um, she served as Elsa's campaign treasurer. And then we also have Minerva, who is an indigenous Mixteca from the southern state of Oaxaca, Mexico. When she was seven years old, her family, uh, she immigrated to, the, to California with her family in search of better opportunities. They then settled in Madera, where she earned a degree in psychology from Fresno State in 2013. And she currently works for the Pan Valley Institute an American Friends Service Committee program advocating for the rights of immigrants. She served as Elsa's campaign co-manager. So welcome, Mujeres. Thank you so much for being here on this call today. Um, and thank you to all of you that are joining us. We are so happy to have you here. We would love to know where y'all are from. Uh, so please put your name and the place that you're coming in from on in the chat, please. So I want to go ahead and get started and tell you guys a little bit about what today's conversation is going to look like. I think we all want to hear a bit from Elsa and, of course, her team and know what her experience was like running for office as and becoming the first indigenous first generation a Latina to to be part of the Madera City Council. So Elsa, I have a few questions for you. Joanna and Minerva, I also have a few questions for y'all, and then we're going to open it up um, and take questions from all of you that are joining us. If you have any questions specifically about running for office um, that I'm not covering in our conversation with these wonderful ladies today, please feel free to jump in and add those to the chat. Um, or when it, we come to the Q&A section at the end, also, um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask the question then. So, Elsa. <laughs> I wanted to go ahead and ask you, you know, I think that for those that may not be familiar with Madera, can you tell us a little bit more about Madera, its location, the demographic makeup of the people there, and what makes Madera special to you? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Elsa Mejia. Um, I am from Madera, California, where I am the newest city council member. There are more than 60,000 people living in the city of Madera. And it's the heart of California. You have a location where you can get to the beach and you can get to the mountains in like <laughs> less than two hours. Um, but you also enjoy the best of both worlds. And what I mean by that is that you have a big city like Fresno that has, you know, everything that you could need nearby, but at the same time, 
you have the calmness of Madera. That's yeah. <laughs> There's not as much traffic here, and it's it's quieter. I can still walk around at night, um, and it's just for me. It's home. It's where my parents settled um, more than 30 years ago, almost 40 years already, and it's where um, my family is flourishing. It's just I have known people here all of my life, and it's just home. Yeah, I love that. And then just to give those of y'all that are coming in and aren't from California, Fresno is the fifth largest city in the state of California. So that's what also means by, you know, a big city that's nearby. I still feel like it's a bit small, but it really isn't. And then Madera is maybe like 30 to 40 minutes away from Fresno, and it's a much more rural area. And a lot of the voters there tend to lean conservative, don't they? And certain parts <laughs> it's, it's certain, in certain parts they there it can be a much more conservative agricultural area um so that's a little bit more information about madera so in terms of personal history i think it's so important to to learn a little bit about who you are because it helps shape us right so can you tell me about your family and what you were like growing up what were some of your interests um yes my family we are from oaxaca mexico my parents uh, migrated here, like I said, almost 40 years ago, but my grandfather had actually already been to Madera even before my dad. He was a bracero, and um, so he, he and people his age, they talk about like the experiences that they had here. Um, well, he already passed away, but there are people that are still um, alive and that, you know, they can talk about the experiences that they had here. Um, I... I grew up moving around a lot. I first, the earliest memory that I have is like living in the county. Um, my parents were farm, farm workers. Um, they've, all of their jobs have always been low wage jobs. And um, I just, I grew up low income and um, we were migrant and there were five of us in my family. Um, so it was it was kind of a struggle to get through school just because my parents didn't have a college education. And it was also a struggle after college as far as, you know, just getting your first entry level job or just all of those skills that we we don't really have just because we're already disadvantaged because of our, um, you know, our background, our situation. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of us that are on the call today can probably relate to that, right? Having to navigate a lot of these systems that are new to our family and therefore new to us and our families don't necessarily speak the language. So then we're kind of thrust into navigating financial aid and school applications and all of these things. So it's incredible that you were able to do that. And then now you are now an elected official. So you also navigated another system that is completely not made for people like us, right? And we'll get to that as well. Um, so when you and I met, we were at both at Fresno State studying political science. Why did you choose to major in political science? And also, can you tell me more about your journalistic background? Mm -hmm. The last question you asked me about my personality type, I've always, or <laughs> what am I What am I like? I'm, I'm an introvert. I have been an introvert ever since I was a child. I, I was like a bookworm. I just love reading. It was my escape, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, to your question, I chose political science because I had several mentors that, well, my passion has always been storytelling since I was a child. I would look at mainstream media and I felt like our stories weren't being told the way that they should be. And I felt that the only people that can really tell them are like people of color or people that have lived those experiences. And so, I've always been passionate about storytelling since I was a child and, and that's why I chose journalism. And one of my mentors told me, um, you should really think about political science. You should figure out how things work to be able to tell your stories better. Um, and so that was kind of on his advice and I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was a struggle, but, <laughs> but I felt like it made me a much more critical thinker than had I just studied journalism. 
I love that. And I'm glad that you bring up the fact that you had mentors in your life who really guided you in different directions, because I think that's so important for, you know, especially first gen college students, because we don't know how to navigate these spaces. So it's always really good to take the advice of those that have come before us. Um, and so I actually want to jump over to Joanna Minerva really quickly and ask a little bit about how they be, got to know you and what they thought about you running for office. And we're going to come back to you, Elsa, but Joanna, let's start off with you. Um, I have known Elsa a long time, forever. Um, we went to school together. That's how we uh, met. And I was actually really excited about the idea of Elsa running. I had been um, thinking she would have been a good fit for a very long time. Um, we've been involved with um, Madeira Votes, for example. Um, so for a long time, we were registering people to vote, encouraging people uh, to get more involved civically. And right away, I, I knew Elsa uh, was someone that could really reflect the community and someone that we can trust someone like us, someone to make decisions that are um, best for the community has been disadvantaged for a very long time. So I was really excited um, and I was willing to help her in whatever capacity I could. I, I had a little bit of experience, but not that much. I, I definitely learned a lot through her campaign, but I was very excited about Elsa running. Awesome. And Minerva, what about you? Well, I also known Elsa since high school, but even after high school, um, um, whenever, like I work for a nonprofit, like I said, advocating for um, um, immigrant rights, social causes, and Elsa would be there um, <laughs> reporting. And so, you know, once in a while, I would give her quotes about the, whatever event we were having at the time. And so, well, you know, th there's been this trend of young people of color running for office, and and Madeira hadn't seen that. So when I first learned that Elsa was a candidate, I got like like Joanna said, I got really excited because I know she's a young woman, an indigenous woman, and she has a history with the community, right? And so I just knew that I needed to support her, like Joanna said, in any way I could, and so. Like, unlike you and I actually came into this campaign with zero experience <laughs> on running a campaign. Um, and like, I like all the team, we learned a lot together. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear that she had the support of so many people that had known her for a long time. So knew what Elsa was about. And then in addition to that, that both of you are strong women who were just like, yeah, I need to, I need to stand behind my friend and help her and support her through her campaign. Um, so also, what were you doing right before you decided to run? I know that you work in communications as a union, uh, at a union. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then how did you, man did you stop doing your job for a little bit in order to run? Or what did that look like for you? Um, I just want to say that there, Minerva and Joanna are here, but there are a lot more women that were part of this, a lot of strong mujeres. And um, I just don't think that they get enough acknowledgement, especially um, senoras. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, they were just a huge backbone <laughs> for our whole campaign. Um, before I ran, I was working in communications. I do communications for SEIU Local 521, and it's a um, public sector union. I, I, I'm still doing communications there full time. City council is, it's supposed to be part time, but it's like really full time and you get a stipend. <laughs> so it doesn't replace my full time job. Okay. And you brought up the stipend. So a lot of people will question like, how much is that? And I think as women and as people of color, sometimes we shy away from talking about this topic. However, I think it is important to just like, obviously every city council is different, every locality is different, but for y'all, do you feel comfortable mentioning that, the amount, what the stipend is? Yeah, I'm comfortable. Um, the stipend is $500 before taxes, $236 after taxes. $236. A, a year? <laughs> or no, how? every month. Every month. Every month. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. There are some places that don't pay folks for their for their labor. So just, um, and as you said, city council is supposed to be like a part-time gig, but when you really 
start doing the work, you realize that it is a lot of work. So you are getting a stipend for the work that you do. Um, and so now I want to jump into why did you decide to run for city council specifically? And how did those around you, those closest to you, like your husband and your family, react to the fact that you were thinking of this idea? Um, so I decided to run for city council because I wanted to be the voice for our district that um, has I, I had felt, you know, that it was it's just an area that looks very different from the rest of Madera. And it's just an area that we don't have the same type of, or I felt like we didn't have the same type of representation. And I wanted to fill that with my education, my background, my, my skills. I thought I could do a good service to my community. Um, my husband opposed the idea at first. He, my husband's from Mexico. He's used to the politics in Mexico and he just, he, he he just came here not that long ago and he just felt like he didn't want me to be in danger. Um, so he kind of didn't really want to hear it at first. <laughs> um, but then he, so that, that was back then because I had thought about running before when he was still in Mexico. When he got here and he saw how everything is so different compared to where we're from, he was more open to the idea and he ended up being really, really supportive. He was my rock <laughs> um, throughout the campaign. Um, he was the one at some points where he was just like pushing me to keep going. And just, he doesn't speak English, but, and that's what held him back. Like he was kind of doubting himself because of that. And I told him that, you know, that's nothing to like stop you. And he realized that it wasn't so. I feel like the campaign was also empowering for him in that sense. That's awesome. And thank you for your honesty and transparency, because I, I do know that there are a lot of people within my family, within you know our families in general, that might be opposed to the idea of, especially their hijas, right? Going into politics and being like, this is a dangerous pl place for you to be in because of their past experience. So I'm really glad that you touch on that, because that's something that People don't usually talk about. And I'm also glad that you mentioned your partner and the way that, you know, he became a supporter, an avid supporter of you. And in what ways was he able to help you during the campaign? I mean, obviously being there as a support system is so much, but was he able to go out and knock on doors with you? What did that look like? Um, emotionally, he was very supportive. And uh, every day he was the one that was like in charge of, um, getting up and going outside to clean and to clean the garage to make sure that all of the food, everything was set up for the canvassers. So like, I guess, logistics. Um, and then he would also walk with me and he learned how to use the software and he would try to, you know, communicate when he could, but he would mostly um, help me with like the software and, you know, getting the, the materials out to people, um, driving a lot of logistic stuff but to this day he's like really supportive emotionally like I know that he's there for me and that is so important and I'm so happy to hear that you have you know a rock in your life like that and I think it's so important for anyone who's thinking about running for office to have people there that serve as emotional support and that are also there to help on the campaign such as Joanna and Minerva um, and so I want to ask all three of you, what did the campaign look like? So Elsa, you mentioned that you guys were kind of running out of a garage. And so your husband was helping with setting up and logistics there. So in terms of, you know, your slogan, some of the issue areas, outreach strategies, especially when we're talking about your specific district. Um, Elsa, let's start with you and then we'll jump to Joanna and Minerva. What's the question? <laughs> yeah, so what did the what did the campaign look like in regards to like what was your slogan? How were you running things, especially when it comes to reaching out to your community? And what were some of the issues that were coming up during the campaign? Okay. Um so the community community grown, community driven was the slogan, um del pueblo para el pueblo. And the root of that was that like Minerva and Joanna mentioned, like I have known people here for a long time. I grew up here, so community grown. <laughs> and um, 
and I was dri driven by, you know, that um, sense of serving my community. Um, Minerva was my co-campaign manager and she said she didn't have experience, but it really didn't look like it <laughs> throughout, like she didn't have experience. I kind of don't believe her that. <laughs> um, I learned a lot from Minerva and, you know, and, and that role that she did. Joanna was treasurer um, and she also didn't have experience, but she also didn't seem like she didn't have experience. Um, she was pretty much on top of all of the financial and she still is to this day. Um, and everybody just kind of, you know, everybody kind of had their role, but everybody at the same time worked together. Yeah, so it wasn't very stringent. It was more of a fluid, cooperative type of campaign, it seems like. Yeah. Um, so Minerva, can you tell us a little bit of what it means to be the, the co-campaign manager, what your role entailed and, and how you helped shape the campaign? Well, I am very glad that I had a, another compañero who helped me because I insist I had no experience on, on this, but I did have fully heart invested in, in, in this campaign. And um, so we did uh, a little bit of everything because this was a grassroots campaign. So we didn't have any dollars. Um, we were running out of Elsa's garage and eating. <laughs> And we were eating and sleeping there. We spent a lot of time. Um, so some of the things that we ended up uh, doing, um, el compañero Jose Chavez and I, is that uh, we, you know, try to bring in resources because again, no money. So even if that meant bringing in like graphic designers to help us with the mailers, um, you know, uh, we did some um, canvassing, phone banking, uh, strategize for what areas to target and what areas, you know, um, we needed to be more visible. And then um, visibility of um, um, uh, events, right? So we had a, uh, there's, there's this parade in Madeira and there was a uh, calenda there and then Dia de los Muertos, we had some event and it was, in, uh, you know, to bring our community around different um, cultural events that we already have, but also, you know, to talk a little bit about Elsa and, you know, for her, for the community to keep uh, asking her questions and for her to keep um, listening from the community. And so some of that we we oversee, uh, we oversaw some of the fundraising activities um, and we thankfully didn't have to manage the finances because Joanna, she did a great job. So we had a lot of questions for Joanna. There were moments where we were like, Joanna, do we have any funds to pay for this? And so it, it, it was a really great experience, a great team. Um, although I have the title of a co-campaign um, manager, honestly, like Elsa say, it was a great team of mujeres, señoras, jóvenes. Um, there was one instance where there was this um, teen who helped us do a <laughs> TikTok that took us forever to get it done, right? Because we, I ha I don't have TikTok, so um, we were relying on her expertise. And so <laughs> everybody really brought in the best of them um, to this campaign. Awesome, I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm happy that you learned new skills and that you were able to get different experience while on the campaign. Joanna, everyone is singing your praises about being awesome at finances. Can you tell us what a campaign treasurer does and what some of your work is now. Yeah, so there's um, the federal protection. I, there's a rule where you're supposed to report um, all the money that's coming in, all the money that's going out, um, even when it's a non-monetary donation. So when some, like when we had an event, somebody donated um, whatever we're gonna use at that event, all of that needs to get reported. Um, so I was just tracking all that information um, and then reporting it by the deadline. Um, and it's something that I had never done before. So I had learned what are the forms, what are the deadlines, um, what specific info do I need to provide? So it was, it was scary at first, I'm not gonna lie. It was scary because I've never done it and I don't wanna um, do something wrong. So I was very careful about everything I did, but I was very proud of our campaign because it was everybody working together. Um, you know, we were all working together to get the information that we needed to meet reports and that deadlines. So it was really nice. One of the main things that stood out to me the most with this campaign, because I've worked on a different campaign before, but this campaign was very community driven. Like everybody on the campaign was from Madeira, very passionate, very committed 
to see an improvement in our community. And I was very proud of the fact that a lot of the volunteers, is not majority of them, spoke different languages, not just Spanish or English. Um, so that was really nice. That was very beautiful. And I think that shows like how much there's potential in, and especially in the district that also is representing now, there's a lot of passion, a lot of, um, a lot of, for a long time, it's just been neglected. And I think that through ELSA, I think the com everybody saw the potential in the community. So I, I'm really just excited about the results and, and just even remembering everything that we went through because it was not fun all the time. It's a lot of canvassing. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of weekends, a lot of, but you know, it was all worth it. Um, and even if ELSA would have not won, I think it would have still been worth it because I think the conversations we had with the community, um, were so important and I think moving forward, it's always good that the community is paying attention and it's realizing, okay, what is city council? What is my school board? What is the difference between the county board of supervisors? There's so much. And, and like you mentioned before, we're first generation. So it's not like our parents are aware of all the different representatives that we have, even at the state level and at the national level. So it was very beautiful to see so much commitment um, from the district and people who spoke different languages. I think that was the most beautiful thing that I saw that stood out from this because for a long time we were neglected and, and this it's tables are turning. It's, we're not going to be no longer neglected. So that's the main thing that stood out to me about the campaign. But thank God everybody helped me with the deadlines um, and understanding, you know, everything that I had to do. So, yeah, it was a, a teamwork, definitely. Awesome. I love the fact that all three of you keep bringing up the, the fact that this was a team effort and that it was so community driven. And Joanna, I want, I want to thank you for talking about the rules a little bit, because I think it's so important for people to know anyone who wants to run for elected office, that there are a lot of rules around financing and reporting, and you have to find yourself someone like Joanna, even if they might not have experience, they have to be a very dedicated person who's good with numbers. Um, and maybe you don't even have to be like the best person with numbers, but someone who is extremely dedicated and open to learning and knowing what those rules are and then teaching others on the campaign what the rules are so that you can all work together collectively and move forward, right? I think that's so important. And so one question that I have, since y'all continue to mention the community drivenness of the campaign is, how do you think you were able to bring so many people together? Like you said, people spoke different languages. Um, people weren't as educated on what representatives were, so at local, state, federal level. Did you all run uh, like educational campaigns or was it just the heart to heart, talking to people, knocking on their door, taking an interest in them? How, what were some of the strategies that you used to bring your community together? And whoever wants to answer this one, go ahead. I don't mind taking a speak on it first. I think, to me, I think the main reason is Elsa has, we also grew up in Madera. We all kind of grew up together. Um, people, I think we all knew each other. And I think the connection and the community being involved for a while, I think helped. Uh, we all grew up here. So our parents, um, when they migrated, I think majority of us, my parents came straight to Madera. Um, so I think that being in the, being growing up in the community and, and it's not too big, but not too small. Like we all kind of know each other a little bit. I think that helped a little bit. Um, but I think the passion more than anything, because everybody who volunteered was so passionate about it. I feel like everybody started bringing in more people. Like I would talk about it with my family and friends and I've always encouraged them to be involved, but this campaign, like when they knew out, like they know Elsa. They trust Elsa. They know Elsa, you know, she's been always been um, involved with the community and doing things um, for the community. So I think that played a big role, I think. Um, but there was more people that I saw get involved for the first time um, that haven't been involved before. And I really do believe it has a lot to do with Elsa. You know, there's a lot of politicians out there who, you know, they're not sincere. And, and when it's, someone who is from the community and has, has seen the struggle and is still caring about what's going on, I think that made a big difference. I think that really did bring out a lot more people. Anyone else feel free to join in? Yeah, and I, and I totally agree with Joanna. And uh, what I would add is that also, well, 
um, something that we did and uh, is that, well, I used to live in District 5 prior to moving that from that district. Uh, uh, my family, when we came, first came to Madeira, it was District 5 that we lived. And we have a lot of family uh, family uh, that live in that district. So we, we ended up visiting a lot of the family, friends that we knew. And a lot of them don't, um, can't vote because they're undocumented, but they have hijos, um, tias, and family members and other people they know. And we would tell them, like, talk to them about Elsa. And if, if they want to speak directly to Elsa and ask her questions and, you know, like, express their concerns, Elsa is here to listen to them. And we tried as much as possible to, though those people who actually said, yeah, I want to meet her, I want to, you know, get to know her better, um, that Elsa would either call them or just go visit them. And so I think that openness to, like, you know, I'm open to visiting and talking to anyone really helped the, the campaign. I think the other thing was that um, I think that those cultural events that we had, I think also helped a lot because the community really got the opportunity to interact one-on-one -on -one with her and get to see her on other aspects and be able to, you know, um, get to know us too, because I think it was interesting that a lot of people, um, didn't know that, you know, like all of our work was volunteer work. Nobody was getting paid in the campaign. We weren't getting, getting, getting um, financed by, you know, big uh, donors or anything like that. So I think that people also saw that as a, as a positive uh, thing in the campaign. Elsa, do you want to add anything? Um, I think it was more like them being able to vouch for me, like, you know, the people that were supporting my campaign. Um, that knew me personally, um, the fact that others trusted them, you know, brought in support. Um, and then what Minerva mentions about um, getting to just see a lot of people from our pueblos or from our family, that was also, that was a good experience for me just because I'm kind of like my mom. My mom's also <laughs> an introvert. So it was like, kind of surprising to see just how many, how many, how much family we have, how many people, you know, are from the same place. And it was really eye opening. That's great to hear. So it, it, it sounds like there was a lot of building of the circle of trust, right? Where I trust you and then that person trusts me and it just kind of grows from there. So that's incredible. And then I do have a question about languages, because I know that sometimes when folks want to run in, in districts where there are plurality of languages, they're like, do I have material in every language? Do I just have someone that speaks every language as part of my campaign? Um, there, there are a lot of questions around language accessibility. So what are some of the things that y'all did since I know that, you know, English, Spanish, but then there are also folks that speak indigenous languages. People might speak Hmong, other languages. What was something that you did to make sure that you were reaching a lot of different folks in the community? Well, let me tell you that we, if we had the budget, we probably translated the material to all of the languages in the <laughs> district. Um, but realistically speaking, we didn't have the funds and we didn't have the time. Um, so our material was, and if I'm correct me if I'm not, if I'm wrong, Elsa or uh, Joanna, it was only in English. And I think we tried to do something in Spanish, at least in social media, it was English, Spanish. Um, that was easier. But in interviews, especially like we have um, a, a program here, Radio, uh, the program left my mind. Um, La Hora Mixteca, I'm sorry. And we had people calling in and Mixteco and giving the message and also in Triki. And when the campus would go out, we would try to partner someone who was bilingual or with someone who only spoke Spanish or, um, and there were, there were the volunteers would come back sometimes and it turns out like some of the houses they visited, people spoke Triki and it was from their community. So they made that connection. So it was really helpful. And unfortunately, like I said, because of time and because of budget, we weren't able to do it, but uh, we try to uh, be as inclusive as possible within you know, the given time and funds. Awesome. Yeah, no, that completely works. A lot of folks that are running for office face the same issue when it comes to finances, not having enough funds to be able to translate everything. But like you said, it's helpful to have people that speak different languages out canvassing so that you're able to pull uh, from different lang people who speak different languages and have them talk to uh, folks on the ground. So that's awesome. 
And so we're getting short on time and I do want to leave time for Q&A, but I have a couple more questions. And one of them is for Elsa and it has to do with your opponents, right? Um, I think that y'all mentioned you had this big community effort and um, you were running this campaign that was not necessarily corporate funded. What did that look like for on your opponent's side if you have that information and also you know, what did you find to be really challenging on this campaign? Um, from my my opponent, she, uh, you know, she had the funds as far as, um, you know, she had the backing and the endorsement. She had the backing of the Democratic Party and the endorsement from uh, established politicians and uh, campaign donors. Um, and that's as far as I know, but, um, and what was the second question? Sorry. <laughs> what was one of the biggest challenges that you feel that you faced during the campaign? Um, just the fact that it was grassroots and that we didn't have that same, um, like those same resources. And also, you know, like those endorsements or, or that backing that was pretty much, I think, like greatest challenge. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that at the local level, things tend to be, or are supposed to be nonpartisan or non-affiliated with politics, correct? However, we do see that there are candidates that get the backing of the Democratic or the Republican Party, and then there are other candidates who run a more grassroots campaign like what you did. So you didn't receive support from either party, um and so you were able to run this campaign and win via a grassroots effort which i think is something to be commended um and i think that that might be something that puts some people off from running in the first place when they say like oh you know i can't i i i don't have the backing of my political party or a political party that i feel closely affiliated with i can't run for office well here you have an example of someone who didn't have that political backing or the endorsements yet still ran a very successful campaign. So I think that that's something that we need to highlight and to celebrate the fact that you don't need all of this other stuff, right? And I think navigating party politics can be difficult, especially for a woman of color and a young woman of color at that. Um, and then so Minerva and Joanna, I know that running a campaign can be very difficult. What did those last few days of the election look like for you? including election night um <laughs> it was intense <laughs> it was intense for me <laughs> um because it took a lot of we were running you know we were getting closer and you know it's gotta hit the floor running um even though we were tired i was tired <laughs> i was super tired of canvassing all the time but you know, I, I feel like at the end, everybody was, it, it's kind of like a rush because it's kind of scary because you don't know what's going to happen. But at the same time, I feel like everybody's so passionate about it that everybody, we all really, we all started seen more than we were throughout the campaign. And even though it was a lot of work, I think that the bottom line was more important than, you know, whether Elsa wins or not. I think that the bottom line of getting people involved and, and seeing people, helping them realize how important this is, I think um, helped everybody. But I think we, I honestly feel like everybody, we all just really wanted some positive change in our community. And I think that's why even there was a lot of hard work, we, we, were, we were going really hard, um, canvassing, phone banking, um, talking to our friends and family and telling my sister, hey, text your friend, <laughs> she lives in the district text uh, her mom, whoever, um, just making those connections, that last push. But um, even on social media too, a lot of um, social media, um, a lot more towards the end than we did. But I really think that at the end of the day, it was really all worth it. Um, because like you mentioned, you know, sometimes it's hard when we don't have um, like the establishment behind us. But I think that I also had more than that and it was people power and it was people willing to donate you know whether it was ten dollars or a hundred dollars 
there was a lot of donations. Like her donations were like a lot more than um, the opponent or um, other local can, um, candidates that I reviewed their financing. Also had a lot of support. Um, so that made a big difference having the community not only canvassing, talking to their family, friends, sharing on social media. I remember when she first launched the campaign, so many people on social media were just sharing everywhere. All my friends, everybody was talking about it. And I think that is more powerful than any um, political establishment. Because at the end of the day, the people, we all we know also we grew up here like it was it was it was really nice to see the movement um but yeah i think that having all the all the voters all the people who live in district who are not voters but they they grew up there so they know people there too i think that really pushes over by a lot thank god <laughs> minerva what was it like for you and what was election night for you, like for you well, I have to make my disclaimer here that <laughs> I actually left to Oaxaca maybe two weeks or a week before the, the election. I, um, I, had a, I had a schedule uh, previous to joining the campaign. Um, so I was in Oaxaca, but prior to leaving, um, and I think we realized this as we were in the campaign that no matter like what the outcome was, that we have won because this was like everybody gained so much experience from being here and everybody had the opportunity of doing something amazing. This was new, this was innovative, this was a glimpse of light that this can be done um, in the community. And um, the fact that everybody was there, you know, weekends, late nights, um, countless hours. And we knew that everybody was there because they really believed that this can happen. They really believe in Elsa, and so we knew that um, no matter what the outcome was, we were we, we had won. Um, and when I left, I I wasn't sure because at some point we I felt, I felt really strong, like you know what, we got this. <laughs> yeah, we got this. But then something would happen, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure now. And so you and you can never know because we're doing the best we can. We're doing all the calls, we're doing all the visits, and all of this. But you really don't know at the end of the day if that uh, person is actually going to go out and cast a boat or mail their boats. You, we don't know. And so um, I, I, that night, I remember there was a chat going on and I keep hearing oh, the numbers, the numbers. And it wasn't until I got a video from Jose and Elsa letting me know that, they, that, we, that we won that I was like, oh, my God, what a relief. What a relief that finally, you know, confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> we got this so it was a very exciting and it was a very um it was just you know magical honestly honestly it was it was amazing amazing work from everybody yeah and i appreciate the disclaimer and i also think it speaks to the importance of the fact that y'all had a co-campaign managers right so it wasn't just like if you left then something terrible was going to happen i think that this is a very interesting model for others to think about as they run their own campaigns like maybe i want two people sharing that manager position because anything could happen right you might have to go on a trip you might have to do other things so i think that that's a really interesting model and i i think you're also speaking very candidly to the like roller coaster of emotions that people feel because like you said there are some things that you can't control all you can do is run the campaign as smoothly and as effectively as you can and like focus on the goal but again you don't know how people are going to vote so yeah it is normal to feel a roller coaster of emotions <laughs> um and elsa what was election night for you like oh well, i'm glad you got signal over there to get the video <laughs> <laughs> um because i know how frustrating that can be it was I was running until 8 p.m. election night and I celebrated a little bit and then I got sick. So I had to go home <laughs> because I was just so tired and stressed already. Um, so everybody stayed celebrating. I was very nervous until the very end. Um, I feel like we were all very nervous, um, but some people were like more optimistic than others. Um, and I think that the co-campaign manager um, that's kind of also reflective of the rest of the campaign, because I feel like a lot of times we would really consult with each other with like a, a core group, like a bigger group. Um, so 
I really like that because sometimes it was easier to talk to Minerva or sometimes it would be like Jose for just getting those different perspectives. But at the end of the day, we would all connect. That's awesome to hear. And also it is very normal for candidates to get sick toward the end <laughs> and to not necessarily have all the energy to celebrate the night of uh, when you're, you know, your winning has been announced and you kind of celebrate afterwards because you don't have a lot of energy. That's completely normal. So I appreciate the honesty. Um, and so Elsa, you made it onto like the cover of newspapers in Mexico, which is, is awesome. And you were sworn in in December of 2021. I saw a newspaper article saying that there was kind of like a celebration outside of city council because it seemed like your community felt seen and heard. What has your first like month or so been like of being in elected office? And I should also note that Elsa needs to hop off in five minutes because she has a city council meeting that she needs to attend. Um, but I do want to know that. So what um, has it been like? So it's a meeting for the housing authority. Um, so not the regular city council meeting. There but, you go. <laughs> um, so right after the campaign ended, I also left to Oaxaca with my husband. Um, I was trying to unplug and just like recharge batteries and self-care. Um, so it kind of didn't help that we were trending in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so then I just like really got off the cell phone. Um, but, you know, people, I understood because people were very proud and very happy and they just really wanted to know everything we're talking about here today. Um, and so we got a warm welcome over there. And um, after that, I was sworn in on December 1st and we had a celebration here and uh, it packed, you know, the chambers, the city hall chambers. That was very exciting. And the first month has been learning you know like all of the reading that it entails and asking questions about the agenda and trying to figure out you know where we are so that's been one of the biggest challenges as far as managing what it takes to you know get educated in where we are and then managing my time with city council and my full-time job and then also um, people have questions you know and even though I might not have all of the answers but I need to talk to my constituents and let them know be honest I'm I don't have all of the answers right now but I'm you know here for you to try to figure this out so it's been a lot but it's it's been a good challenge <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that the chambers were packed and that people felt seen in your community and felt welcomed in that space because I think in a lot of our communities parents, you know, family members don't even go to city council. Like, why would they go there? But it's because they had someone that was reflective of their community that was there. And I think that that's why it's so powerful to get Latinas and people that are in the community into these positions. So as a friend, I'm very proud of you. I've already told you that. Um, but I also just want to make this, you know, a plug for anyone who's thinking about running for office that you can do it. And so I do want to give people time to ask any questions. If anyone has a question for Elsa or Joanna and Minerva, feel free to plug it into the chat or just go off mute and ask your question. No audience questions today. Um, um, but oh, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, uh, let me turn on my video there. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to share some of your experience. Um, I know that I've uh, participated in campaigns and uh, created committees, as Joanna has mentioned about, you know, wanting to make sure that you follow the rules. Um, not much of a question because you've addressed a lot of the things that I feel have been um, relative to my experience in the political world as a first generation, you know, understanding agendas, understanding um, uh, uh, the flow of meetings, you know, um, I just want to say that I appreciate you sharing that experience. And it's awesome to hear that you've made the reach to even um, in, in Mexico and, and in our communities. Um, the, the aspect of talking to people in, in different languages hits very close to home because in campaigning, I understand grassroots, it's two minutes and that's it. And then you also wanna help them understand, especially in city council, um, just 
I want to say thank you for that. And I look forward to many more of these meetings. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we have another question, Ivy. Feel free to jump in. Hi, yes, good evening. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Latinas Represent for organizing this event. And then also to thank you to the three women who are here speaking and help and educating us on this on this process. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, I know that you indicated that your opponent was also a woman, but just wonder if you faced any issues that you think you might not have faced on the campaign had you been a man. Uh, or someone who identified as such. Um, did you, did gender in any way factor in to, um, into the campaigning or even into, as you were door knocking um, in terms of uh, questions or comments by constituents? Um, because, uh, you know, right, the reality still is unfortunately that um, politics is still a very male centered uh, arena. And so just wondering if, if gender played any role whatsoever for, for, for you as a candidate and maybe even for some of the staff. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for being here and for your question. Um, I feel that, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously can't speak for male candidates, but from, for me, I feel that, you know, sexual harassment is um, something like a huge challenge that I've had to face and um, also comments about the fact that I'm not, I chose not to be a mother yet. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so that kind of thing, those are some of the challenges. And I thought I was going to get like that I'm too young, but I didn't really see that. Mm -hmm. And Minerva, Joanna, I know Elsa needs to hop off. Um, so I want to just say thank you again, Elsa, for your time. I hope that you have a good meeting. And thank you so much again for speaking with us. And I really appreciate you you being on the call. And as I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, but I, I do want to ask Joanna and Minerva the same question. You know, did y'all see Elsa face anything or did y'all personally face anything as the co-campaign manager or the treasurer that had to do with gender? or any other type of discrimination? Um, I was a canvasser also. Um, and yeah, I think um, like Elsa mentioned, there was a lot of comments that I think were a little bit inappropriate when we were canvassing about, um, about her. Um, and I, I'm glad she mentioned it because it's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned it, but yeah, we, we did get a uh, comments, um, sexual harassment. Um, and I think that's very, it concern, obviously is concerning, you know, just on the face of it. But I think moving forward, I think that it's something that needs to be like discussed more um, and addressed and, you know, and shamed and, and make sure that it, that, people know that that's not okay because I think that that can play a role on you know females um running or even considering to run or consider being involved because because of that um so yeah I think that that's I'm glad that she brought that up because yeah we we did see that quite a bit even before she ran we would see that quite a bit unfortunately yeah thank you Joanna um yeah, I, I echo what Joanna said and, and Elsa. And um, that's an unfortunate thing, you know, that still happens despite this big Me Too movement and all of this um, that you would think there's been some progress made, but um, we, we saw it firsthand, right? Being called names and stuff. Um, so yeah, other than that, I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Ivy, for the question um, and, and for bringing up the both of you and Elsa, you know, for being honest about the realities of what it's like to be running or helping someone on a campaign and being a woman. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I any other questions? If there are no other questions, I do want to ask Joanna and Minerva, what advice do you have for another Latina who's thinking about you know, their friends should run for office or thinking about running for office or getting involved in politics. What advice would you give that Latina um, if she was standing in front of you today? 
I would say to do it. <laughs> um, I know it's not easy, and I know it's not always fun, because sometimes going to those meetings, the city council meetings can be forever. Um, I've attended some that are more than five hours, and they start at 6 um, p.m. in the afternoon. So um, I know it's not easy, but I feel like the the bigger picture is that, you know, for a long time, the way that I saw it, especially here for the district of um, where else was representing now, um, we were dismissed. Um, her district was, if you look at Madera, her district is the one that, you know, doesn't have, you know, the best streets, the best lighting, the best um, cleaning, you know, if they're gonna, um, if there's some funding coming in, it usually goes to the other side of town. So I feel like for a long time, at least for me, I really took it personal that, um, they really dismissed us, and I really do feel that they knew our parents didn't speak the language, our parents weren't voting. Um, so I feel like, you know, it's time for us to stand up and tell them, you know, um, you can't just dismiss us, you can't just give us the short end of the stick just because our parents didn't speak the language. Um, so I, I, I would encourage uh, more Latinas to to run. I know it's not easy, um, but I think it's um, definitely worth it. So and so, I would just encourage them um, surround themselves with um, other people who who truly understand how important it is to have the representation, um, and just speak to the community about the issues. Um, because I, I will never stop being amazed about how much support Elsa got, how many people were willing to donate money and time, and and just spread the word. People who typically don't even vote, people who never cared about voting, and they were the ones that were spreading the, you know, telling everybody vote for Elsa. So I feel like if it's genuine and 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 it's about issues that you care that are going on locally, I think that the community will will connect with you and, and they'll help you too, even if it's hard, even if you don't have the backing of the establishment, because at first that was a little bit intimidating, that was a little bit discouraging, but I felt like once I started seeing that it's the community that was coming out for her, that it, it didn't really matter who, else wasn't but yeah i would encourage people to do it um it's and even like the financials it kind of feels like a lot at first but you really do get used to it you get in the habit of okay i need this info i need to press the deadline and just surrounding but yourself by people who also care i think that makes a big difference great advice minerva anything else you want to add yeah i i want to emphasize on that of like having a team of people that really believe in you and that really believe in what you're trying to accomplish and whose values align with yours because um at the end of the day like you know you're gonna spend so much time with them <laughs> they're gonna be the ones seeing your listen to your frustrations but also like celebrations right um so having a, a, a team that really um, supports you and understands what you're going through is i think essential and it will keep you going um, I also I also think that like you know having your family who also knows of what you're gonna do and what it entails because it also involves them right like the whole family is a es un negocio de familia esto because everybody's gonna go out canvassing for you and they're your representatives in the community so is the uh, that to do, to have that and I agree like don't be intimidated by not being back by unions or by the establishment in many ways because it is your constituents at the end of the day who will decide. You could have the president <laughs> back you up, but if your constituents vote for you, that you you have it, you have it and you need to trust in that and be as genuine as you can uh, uh, when you're speaking to them and listen to them because I think that's what the community needs. So sometimes um, many politicians just assume of what the community needs and it never bothers to go and listen to them and i think that's very important um to listen to the community and just just do it you at least will gain the experience of what it takes and then you try again if you don't win the first time yes awesome advice thank you both so much and i also want to say i think elsa is very lucky to have such strong mujeres and i know that she mentioned you know, it wasn't just you two, it was a whole team and it was senoras and jovenes and all of these individuals that came out for her. So I, I want to say, you know, again, just reiterate the fact that building a grassroots campaign is possible, winning with the grassroots campaign is possible, and that, you know, to surround yourself with people who believe in you and believe in your mission. So 
Thank you all so much for joining us during this call today. I also see in the chat that Cassandra is joining us from Connecticut. So it's almost, it's 9 p.m. for her. Um, so I, I do want to give a shout out to anyone on the East Coast or anyone on a different time zone who is, has been with us the whole time. Thank you so much for your time. We're looking forward to having more of these conversations throughout the year. And if you know of any Latina who you think would be great uh, that you want to hear more from, feel free to send them to info at latinasrepresent.org. Um, and also at the end of this, once you log off, we will have uh, a, a very quick survey. It's only three questions that are going to help us kind of inform future conversations. So please make sure that you take that. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us. And I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye.